would like to start the recording. Thank you. Um, I'm Catherine Kidd, and I am the curator for this course and um, the facilitator for today's class, uh, along with Dr. Santangelo. Um, Lauren is a uh, historian uh, of the United States uh, dealing with uh, gender issues uh, and the urban environment. Uh, she teaches in the writing program at Princeton University uh, and uh, wrote a very, very well received book on uh, suffrage and the city, uh, New York women's uh, battle for the vote. Um, uh, ballot, battle for the Ballot, um, and that was uh, published by Oxford University Press. Um, Lauren earned her uh, bachelor's degree at Marist College and her PhD from City University of New York. Uh, she has had postdoctoral fellowships uh, at the New York Historical Society and the College of Liberal Arts at the New School. Um, it, her, I was really excited to connect with Lauren and her research uh, because she's doing really groundbreaking uh, research um, on um, mapping and um, using some of the digital mapping techniques uh, which uh, have developed, uh, but using them in an historical way. Uh, so it's a, a very exciting uh, kind of work, and we're going to see a sample of that today. Uh, Lauren is uh, currently doing research on um, Italian American uh, survivors of sexual assault in the 1920s. Uh, and um, uh, so I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lauren. Uh, and thank you so much uh, for being with us today. Thank you for that. Thank you for having me. I feel like I should say that I'm um, coming from Beacon, New York, uh, to add that to kind of the map. Um, thanks for having me today. Thanks especially to Dr. Kidd for organizing and inviting me. Um, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to speak with you all. Um, today, uh, as was mentioned, I'm going to be drawing on and adding some of the um, from some of the ideas and evidence discussed in my book, Suffrage in the City, as well as a growing and robust scholarship on New York City and suffrage. But before I do so and get into the concrete details of suffrage, I wanted to introduce a more general theoretical framing, one of space, uh, one I apply in my own research and my own day-to-day -day life. Uh, to that end, I wanted to ask everyone to maybe uh, grab a pen or uh, open a blank document on your computer, and I'd invite you to write for five minutes in response to this quote. Um, so the quote says, uh, it's from two feminist geographers, um, and they summarize their three key arguments. They say, uh, one, that the design and use of our built environment is determined in part by assumptions about gender roles and relations or as we like to say, space is gendered, that spatial organization and relations are not simply a neutral backdrop for human dramas, but instead help to shape them. Three, that gender is an important interpretive lens that influences human relationships to and perceptions of both built and natural environments. And I'll keep time and I was hoping we could just, I'd invite you to write for three or so minutes um, with the idea that hopefully we could keep it so that our pen, our cursor outpaces our brain to see kind of what we write ourselves into. So with that said, I'll mute myself um, and keep time for us. Some general, now that we've laid some general theoretical frameworks in making visible the built environment, space, and geography, I want to pivot to the more concrete topic at hand, suffrage. My interest in the topic stems from a puzzle. Here's the first part of it. Here are all the states that eliminated manhood as a criteria for voting prior to 1917, when New York amended its constitution to do the same. I don't say enfranchise women here, because of course, gender is only one factor that determined access to the ballot, race, ethnicity, literacy, class being factors as well. And you'll note that it's mainly Western states that the map indicates has full suffrage. That's striking to me when I contextualize it. 
That's the second part of the puzzle. When we think about all the resources that would have existed in New York, the political, financial, and social power in the state. Here are just some examples. New York State controlled 45 votes in the Electoral College. New York City's banking power was something like 23% of the national total. More than 5 million people lived in New York City in 1915. New York claimed 27,000 factories and shops, 280 colleges and academies, 125 places of amusement, 600 hotels and 3,000 restaurants. And that really only touches the surface. New York, for instance, is home to the film industry prior to World War I, as, home, as well as home to the stage, restaurants, and hotels and department stores. So the riddle for me was why is New York with all of these resources, one of the last states to change its constitution, to amend its constitution? New York state does so only three years before the 19th amendment in 1917. So at its broadest, my research grapples with why New York is so late in this top timeline. And it really zeroes in, in on New York City to explore the complicated relationship between gender, political activism and urban space. How did ideas about city, especially about gendered as well as racialized and class notions of safety and violence influence campaign decisions? Inversely, how did women challenge these norms to demand the vote and thereby redefine the cityscape? To help place us mentally in the early 20th century, I wanted to show um, about a minute and a half of footage of the streetscape um, from a documentary that um, is done in 1911 that the Museum of Modern Art has generously uh, digitized. Um, and while we watch it, you might keep in mind the ideas of spaces in the built environment uh, and see what you um, notice. So hopefully this will play. So again, I'll play about a minute and a half of it. flipping from different neighborhoods. stop it there. Um, so how did suffragists understand such a busy and dynamic environment? What I have found was that in order to win in New York City, suffragists had to learn to read the metropolis as a text with layers of meaning and pockets of influence and move from understanding it as kind of a place of frustration to recognizing it as a place of possibilities. Gotham then is, simple, is more than simply a stage for suffrage action, it's actually part of the drama. And a couple notes. In showing this, I'm largely focusing on the activities of a few organizations, primarily the National American Women's Suffrage Association, the Women's Suffrage Party, the Empire State Campaign Committee, and the New York City Women's Suffrage League. It's important to define this because there really isn't a singular suffrage movement, but kind of suffrage movements 
Um, the movement as we know it is really one of heterogeneous campaigns filled with solidarities and conflicts, one that extends well beyond these few organizations that I'll discuss today. We know, for instance, that Black women sometimes join the National American Women's Suffrage Association, but also frequently organized outside of it, protesting racism that they encountered. We also know that socialist women in New York City in December 1909, for instance, according to the New York Times, quote, declared themselves with one voice to be women suffragists, but they say the organized women suffragists uh, of the National American Women's Suffrage Association belong to the capitalistic class and can never have anything in common with them. They refuse to cooperate. Thus, in discussing these organizations today, I'm really focusing on one slice of a much longer and more diverse fight for the ballot within the United States, one that's still ongoing. There are a host of examples that highlight these organizations changing relationship to the nation's largest city. I thought today I'd look at four moments or flashpoints in the campaign. Um, and use some mapping to highlight the changing nature of that relationship. So I have four maps to share with you today. Um, one is from 1885, one, and I'm gonna step through these. One is from 1894, one from 1915, and one from 1916. These maps are all based on geo-referenced fire insurance atlases, and they mark suffrage sites mentioned in key publications like the Women's Journal and the Women Voter in the same weeks in late March and early April. So the idea was to try to kind of control some of the variables. As an aside, there are some more robust maps at mappingsuffrage.com, which is a digital humanities initiative I created. Um, to build a way to search suffrage activities. There are draft maps for 1870, 1890, and 1910 there. Bonus, they include, include the whole year and they're searchable. But for today, let's just focus on these four maps, kind of slices. Uh, and admittedly, in investigating this, I'm really focusing on Manhattan at the expense of other boroughs. And as I mentioned, the suffrage organizations outlined here, like the New York City Women's Suffrage League, are far from representative of the diverse metropolis. Working class women, native born and immigrant, black and white, certainly participated. A few emerged as influential figures, and some organizations even created ethnic race and class-based affiliated societies. But the leadership of the organizations discussed here today remained largely white and middle class despite efforts to contest this. I think it's important to recognize that gender restricted suffragist mobility in the urban environment at the same time that organizers race and class bestowed on them a privilege most working class African-American or immigrant women would never know. And a privilege we need to name and make visible in order to problematize. So let me jump to the next, the first slide. Um, and you'll notice on all of these, just to orient us, that middle green section is Central Park. And you'll notice that the uh, first map is relatively empty. It's underscoring the campaign's small size and difficulty with using the metropolis during its earliest years. It shows one meeting. Um, the New York City Women's Suffrage League is kind of a key organization at this time period. It's led by Lily Devereaux Blake who is a journalist and writer turned career suffragist who's deeply committed to the cause, also easily slighted. She has a, a kind of a major falling out with Susan B. Anthony by centuries end. Um, overall in the late 19th century, her league struggled with campaigning for the vote in a city that many deemed dangerous, especially for middle and upper class white women like Blake. Cities are thought of as dangerous for a host of reasons. For one, as historian Mary Ryan has discussed, they lack neat divisions of people. City streets threw men and women of all backgrounds together. Even more disconcerting than the absence of spatial divisions was the anonymity that defined urban life. In a small rural town, you would know who a newcomer or stranger was. In the city, everyone was potentially a stranger. They're considered particularly dangerous for women as streets make women vulnerable to risks of sexual impropriety and attacks from oogling to sexual assaults. 
There's specific etiquette in place for middle-class women in cities, from dining at restaurants to traveling on streets. Metropolitan etiquette demanded that women have chaperones. Women needed to, quote, show reserve on city streets, one etiquette manual decreed, and act oblivious of those whom she does not include within her circle of friends. Suffragists don't really challenge this entrenched gender geography in the 1870s and 1880s as evidenced by the 1885 map. Their arguments and ideas instead reflected an acceptance of it. In fact, Blake even publishes a novel in 1874 called Fetter for Life, Fetter for Life, that relies on the dangers in the city to propel her story forward. The main character in the story actually travels from her father's oppressive farm in Dutchess County, New York, um, to the city in hopes of gaining some freedom. But she's quickly confronted with a host of urban violences, political corruption, sexual harassment. There's even a failed kidnapping attempt in the story. Ultimately, the only woman in Blake's story who has the freedom to use the city must present as a man in order to do so. Blake's certainly not envisioning the metropolis as a utopia for women, and her percep perception of the metropolis informs how she strategized about campaigning within it in real life. The diversity in the city, as well as its place as corporate headquarters, helped to convince organizers that not only was it difficult to campaign, campaign in the metropolis, it might in fact be futile. With its legions of immigrants in large corporations, they assumed the city was conservative and would oppose their effort. More spaces certainly opened for white middle-class women in Gilded Age New York, department stores in particular, provided a safe refuge, but organizers um, in these associations refrained from taking full advantage of them. From the 1870s through the early 1890s, they largely limited their gatherings to private homes, followed by the occasional hall and hotel. There is a couple notable exceptions, and I thought I would share one, which is the protest they hold at the unveiling of the Statue of Liberty in 1886. Um, for suffragists, unveiling day, which is a public holiday in New York, presented this prime opportunity to make their cause more visible. Uh, and they hope to be included in the day's ceremonies. Blake sees though, when suffragists aren't included in the day's events. What a monstrous absurdity that men should unite to do honor to liberty represented by a woman while refusing liberty to women. Blake actually uh, charters a boat for $100. There is like $4 left in the treasury or something. She has to sell tickets to make up the difference in order to rent a boat. Um, she has to settle for the cheapest one, which ends up being a cattle barge, which the owner had to promise to scour to eliminate any animal odor. But they do, they hold a protest. Um, and it's actually covered by the New York Times as that, uh, uh, that clipping shows. Um, Blake and her peers steer the vessel close to Bedloe's Island to protest their ballotless state during the official ceremonies. Those celebrating might not see the suffrage demonstration amid the fanfare, but those involved felt committed to demonstrating anyway, even if doing so was uncomfortable. Again, though, such public protest and action is the exception, not the norm during this moment. In this case, they also clung to the vessel. They don't actually disembark. I'm gonna jump forward to about a decade. Um, this is a map of 1894 from the same uh, few weeks. It demonstrates a gradual change. It marks meetings again during the same weeks as the map from 1885. It shows, I think, that the organizations are more frequently using spaces within the metropolis. So the question then is like, what happens? What explains just shift? And the thing to know about 1894 is 1894 is the year of a New York state constitutional convention. And there's a significant upsurge of activity as organizers, I think overly optimistically, hope they can convince delegates to support an amendment. Many of the meetings in advance of the convention remain in people's homes. But there are two spaces that I'm hoping to draw our attention to, two suffrage headquarters, actually. One at 14th Street and the other at Sherry's. Um, these headquarters not only suggest the increased frequency of the meetings, but also kind of a more strategic reading of the metropolis. And 
you could see that white um, pin marks um, the 14th Street uh, headquarters. Blake and her New York City Women's Suffrage League are the ones who open the headquarters in a small room on 14th Street. Their visitors found maps of assembly and Senate districts on the wall, photographs of suffrage pioneers, including Stanton and Anthony, literature, and an officer of the City Suffrage League. What's notable to me is where the headquarters is located. Uh, the spot seems calculated. By placing their headquarters on 14th Street near Fifth Avenue, suffragists had in fact centered their campaign at the beginning of Ladies Mile, Mile which is a high-end shopping district in Manhattan between 14th and 23rd Streets and Broadway and Sixth Avenue. According to one 1892 travel guide, this area was home to prominent retail establishments that are the wonder and admiration of all who see them and an extent in a variety of goods, they are not surpassed elsewhere in the world. The headquarters adjacent to an elegant dry goods store near Macy's and around the corner from Tiffany's jeweler. And in fact, in this photograph, you could see um, kind of just how much of a, a lady's mile it was. Um, the photographs uh, shows 14th Street from six looking toward Fifth Avenue. And you could really see that women dominate the streets. Window shopping at um, Macy's, I think you could probably see that RH beginning there. Um, in fact, it's men that are marginalized in this photograph, literally pushed to the curb. So this headquarters, albeit small and fleeting, I think ma marked one of ba Blake's and her organization's first strategic and sustained uses of Manhattan. They were placing the heart of their campaign at a location convenient for women, both shoppers and those employed at department stores. At the same time in 1894, there's a parallel group of women who get involved. They're excessively wealthy women uh, and they create a society suffrage campaign that both competes with and complements Blake's work. I'm talking about women like Olivia Sage or Mrs. Russell, uh, Mrs. Russell Sage or Laura D. Rockefeller, Mrs. John D. Rockefeller. They lend their names and their homes to the cause. People like Mary Putnam Jacoby is key in organizing this uh, parallel society. Um, the women in this contingent, though, decide not to go to 14th Street for headquarters. They open up their own headquarters at Sherry's. Sherry's is a uh, was a respected restaurant where society already felt at home. So these new converts use it to temper an argument that many still considered radical. As one reporter remarked, it took political skill for these women to realize that placing their citadel on the crest of Murray Hill, Murray Hill being the neighborhood, uh, was a better strategy than trailing their skirts in the byways of the city. By doing so, they maintained their respectability and made it convenient for members of the gentry to voice their support. They recognized that physical space carried status and they had the means to use it to their advantage. You could really see how class affects access to space here. And I, uh, these images uh, are just rich with detail. In the one to the left, you see a group of women um, sitting around a table, um, kind of looks like, uh, furiously working on something, kind of ignoring the litter that's piling up below them in the revision process. Um, the one on the right is a little bit more, or not a little bit, is more sarcastic. Um, it's called society's latest fad. And you have a woman kind of hovering over a businessman pressuring him to sign her suffrage petition. And many journalists uh, did actually consider society women's involvement a fad. So this was kind of a refrain that we see throughout the newspapers. Despite the great upsurge in organizing in 1894 and strategic use of urban space, activists failed to convince delegates at the New York State Constitutional Convention to support an amendment to the Constitution. And what's really interesting to me is some of the arguments or rationales that are put forward. Uh, in fact, woven into some delegates reasoning was a discussion of the problems enfranchisement would create in cities. One delegate from Syracuse thought it unfair to point to Wyoming as a precedent for women voting. For New York, since New York was a state that was filled with cities that were, quote, seething cauldrons of political heat and excitement, 
hotbeds of vice and corruption and home to swarms of criminals. Thus, delegates were leveraging anti-urban beliefs as a rationale to oppose suffrage. At this moment then, suffragists confronted the very assumptions about cities that they themselves had perpetuated. Their foes were brandishing the arguments that Blake had made so clear in her earlier novel. Even with this new energy, the, I think the map hints at these organizations understanding of the metropolis as one largely undifferentiated monolith. They're not really start, uh, strategically targeting districts as they would later, not really contesting the gender geography, and they're not consistently tailoring their arguments to different groups as they would later. Um, which brings me to kind of the next group of uh, individuals I want to spotlight. Blake retires in the early 20th century, and her organization basically collapses slightly before then, marking the end of what we might consider a pioneer generation and creating a power vacuum that a second generation filled around 1907. To take three to kind of highlight kind of the uh, diversity and strategies, we could look at uh, Kat Blatch and Malone. Uh, led by little remembered but incredibly radical librarian Maud Malone, the independent and determined Harriet Stanton Bletch, who's Elizabeth Kitty Stanton's daughter, and the organizer in chief, Carrie Chapman Catt, this progressive era generation built off the insights from the first generation. But at the same time, they also began to understand the city as a text with many subcultures and spaces that could be mobilized and tapped into. Each of these individuals had different approaches to the metropolis that they found themselves in. They stretched the spectrum from suffragist to suffragette, a term that is applied to more radical or militant suffragists. Although that difference would become blurred by the mid 1910s. So let me just briefly um, describe those, these three individuals. Kat is president of the national organization from 1900 to 1904. She focuses on political organizing and represents the suffragist end. She spearheads the creation of the Women's Suffrage Party in 1909, which really revolutionized the way uh, in which suffrage organized itself. Rather than basing organizations on clubs with amorphous boundaries or shared interests, the Women's Suffrage Party organized itself around assembly districts, the districts that elected members to the New York State Assembly. The association would force a representative to take enfranchisement seriously by showing him that constituents did via this assembly district model. And other state and local organizations would follow this precedent. On the other end is Maud Malone, a little known figure, I think has been really lost to the historical record. Um, but the librarian is fiercely committed to democracy and spreading the suffrage message. In 1907, she, along with the British militant, held the first open air meeting uh, at a rally in Madison Square on New Year's Eve, 1907. Again, keep in mind what a radical move this was um, for a, a group of women trying to underscore their respectability and um, in a space where taking political action could have been seen as scandalous. In early 1908, Malone's responsible for helping to organize the first suffrage parade. It's actually not the first official suffrage parade because um, they're, they're not officially able to march. The police um, required a permit, which organizers did not have to march on a Sunday, but they kind of have an unofficial march up to the Manhattan Trade School. People like Kat would come to accept a lot of uh, the strategies that Malone introduced and the distinction between suffragist and suffragette would really blur in New York City by 1915. And in the middle of these two, I put Harriet Stanton Blatch, who is the daughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And again, she sits somewhere between these two extremes. She is committed to political organizing, but she also appreciates the need for publicity stunts, even in the earliest years. She works to end gendered barriers in places like restaurants, unsuccessfully suing a restaurant that refused to seat her and a female friend one evening. She's a key leader in the Women's Political Union, another Manhattan-based organization. And along with women like Mary Hay, um, helped to reinvigorate the campaign and changed its approach to New York City. 
think now is a good opportunity perhaps to break, to take a five minute break to stretch or get coffee. Um, and then when we return, we can do some a little bit more kind of writing around some photographs and return to these individuals to kind of make concrete those different strategies. Uh, as then I move forward to 1915 and 1916. So I'm going to, uh, it's 2.05, so let's reconvene at 2.10. You welcome everyone back. Um, and to kind of settle us back in, I thought we could look at these two images of Madison Square. Um, one is workers looking down on the park from uh, the Metropolitan Tower. The other is kind of the tower at a distance. And I thought uh, I'd invite you to spend a few minutes writing around them. What do you notice about this as in terms of, po of political space? What do you see um, here? Um, what might you mention or think about? Again, the idea is to just write uh, and see what you end up writing yourself into. But if we think about this as a space for political activity, what kind of do we notice or think about? Um, and I will mute myself to give us an opportunity to um, write for three minutes. And then I will talk about how different suffragists use this same space. Talk about the 19 the 1911 Wall Street protest, wherein activists are chased out of the finan financial district or how cigarettes morph into a scandal once they reach um, a vaudeville house. I'm happy to talk more about that. Sometimes they even mobilize the threat of a stunt, like with the women's strike, which is the clipping on the right side. Uh, the plan was for women to refuse to leave home for one day to prove how few actually remain there and how important their work outside the private realm was to the city's daily functioning. Suffragists reported that as soon as they thought up the scheme, they realized it impossible to carry out because it would, quote, cripple the world's work to an irreparable extent. Nevertheless, they advertised it to make a point. The effect was instantaneous and amazing when reflected. Everywhere men were appalled at the suggestion. Merchants, hospitals, captains of industry, schools, telephone exchanges. They saw the entire business of the city at a standstill. I think the most memorable and visible efforts come in the form of suffrage parades. And here is an image of women marching on the streets. The first large scale parade in New York City was in 1910. And in each succeeding year, the crowds increased. Leaders carefully curated these events in order to underscore the campaign's respectability. Obsessing over everything from what people wore to the size of the police force needed to maintain order. We wish to make the processions a great emotional appeal, Blatch explained. The enemy must be converted through size. At this moment of the centennial though, we should be careful not to romanticize these organizations. As it could potentially be easy to do as we see these celebratory photographs of women braving the streets flash across our computer screens. The National American Women's Suffrage Association, Women's Suffrage Party, and other organizations were led by white middle-class native-born women, many of whom actively resisted at worst or passively ignored empowering working class immigrant and or African-American women. There are efforts to contest this, of course, um, for instance, Leonora O'Reilly, who's the daughter of Irish immigrants, a factory laborer and union organizer and suffragist, published a piece discussing how much wealthy suffrage socialites like Elva Belmont learned when she helped textile strikers in 1909, challenging assumptions about who was helping who. These elite women might not have done the strikers any good, O'Reilly boldly claimed, but the strike did these wealthy suffragists good and showing them the commonality of womanhood. There is no doubt that the strike has clearly demonstrated the need for women of all classes and grades to work hand in hand and shoulder to shoulder to their mutual benefit, O'Reilly concluded. The famous anti-lynching crusader, crusader Ira B. Wells famously refused to accept that black women had to march at the end of the 1913 suffrage parade in Washington, DC, 
jumping into the Illinois delegation as it marched by. Just as a side point, if you're interested in these photographs and how individuals decided to represent themselves, um, these, this, uh, you might check out Alison Lang's new book, um, which recently came out, Picturing Political Power. Uh, and if you're interested in how Black women served as the vanguard for voting rights, Martha Jones's new book is the book to, or a, a key book to consult. Despite these efforts, Barriers remain for women of color, immigrant women, and working class women. In 1894, Adele Field, who is a um, member of the society contingent at Sherry's, detailed to the New York Times how the census proved that amending the Constitution would not mean that more immigrant women would vote than native born women. Instead, it would increase the native born vote's control over the electorate. Two decades later, we see a similar refrain. In that year, the Women Voter published a piece announcing there are four times as many native born white women in New York State eligible to vote as foreign born who will be eligible, eligible to vote. With women's suffrage, the native born white voters will outnumber the foreign born eight to one. So while the map suggests the reach of the campaign, and we've talked about all of these changes, it's important to remain aware of these organizations' own assumptions, biases, prejudices, and privileges, and how this shaped their approach. Moreover, they might have been gaining greater access to the city, but greater access doesn't necessarily translate into men's support for enfranchisement, as was made clear at the 1915 statewide referendum. Like most history, suffrage isn't a neat story, is not a story of neat progress, and access doesn't lead directly to political power. Suffragists, in fact, failed to convert enough men to win at the 1915 referendum. And at least with some of their stunts, as I kind of alluded to with Wall Street in 1911, might have offended the men they needed to convert. 58% of Manhattan men voted against enfranchisement in 1915. Suffragists then had to find a way to use their increased urban presence to support men's agenda rather than focusing on their own. This brings me to my last slide, which shows a stark change from the one in 1915. There's no outdoor protests, less frequent gatherings, no real spectacles. But quiet work didn't mean that nothing was happening. They revised their approach to the metropolis for a second statewide referendum in 1917, using their relationship with the city to more effectively support rather than challenge men's agendas. Having claimed a right to the city, they now demonstrated how they could nurture and safeguard its citizens, replacing spectacles with service and collaboration. And there's two things that happen in 1916 and 1917 that provide kind of the space to do that. One is a polio epidemic in New York City in 1916, and the other is the Great War in 1917. This provided an opportunity to, for instance, spread information about present, preventing, the, uh, preventing polio for the health department and pledge themselves to working for the government in warfare even while there's tension within organizations about this decision. This image anticipates the larger, more visible shift to municipal housekeeping in 1916, 1917. It's an image from the women voter from May, 1916. And we see a child saying, I wish my mother had a vote to keep the germs away. And we see ants, um, climbing into the, the room and onto the child's bottle. Uh, again, this image anticipates the larger, more visible shift to municipal housekeeping in 1916, 1917. This rhetoric had existed in the campaign for decades. It's essentially the idea that women needed the vote to better the world for their children. And, set, and since government decisions affected the home, they should have a say in those decisions. The crises of 1916 and 1917, combined with suffragists urban expertise, allowed them to put this rhetoric into action as they helped, for instance, the government take a military census. This military census is intended to demonstrate the state's military resources. And organizations like the Women's Suffrage Party immediately volunteered to help, ready to showcase their quote, great familiarity with district lines in their training and systematic procedure. Despite some government hesitancy, officials ultimately did accept the offer. 
a suffrage headquarters in Brooklyn transformed into a general bureau of invest information for the census work and advocates fielded telephone questions from residents trying to determine their assembly districts. Later, the government praises their work. The chair of the mayor's committee on national defense sent a letter that described the city's party census contribution as invaluable, recognizing that the municipality might not have completed the project without the 11,700 suffragists who volunteered to assist. Suffragists don't just participate in the census, they politicize the census in their participation. And this is a uh, selection from one of the flyers they put out. A one state flyer uses the census to challenge men who thought that women casting a ballot would destroy femininity. In the pointed flyer, they say, they asked, um, they, they asked, um, did your wife neglect your home or babies? when she went to register in the military census? Did she meet with any but courtesy and respectful treatment from the men she saw there? Did she feel less feminine, less womanly, or less motherly for having registered? And then the author deftly pivoted to the point. Do you know that when she registered in the military census, she experienced practically the same procedure she would go through if she were a full-fledged voter? Except that voting is less complicated, less personal and is not compulsory. A 1917 suffrage film and late October 1917 suffrage parade further tied together women's sacrifice and work for the country and their desire for the franchise. After a half century campaign in New York, organizers waited anxiously for the outcome of the 1917 referendum on November 6, wondering if their new approach had paid off. Wild joy seen in headquarters, exclaimed one newspaper column, describing the celebratory scene once suffragists realized they had won. Victory makes all women kin on day of rejoicing in city, another described. The women's citizen headline simply announced, glory, glory, hallelujah. Perhaps most surprising, New York City had carried the state for suffrage in 1917, reversing long-held assumptions that it would be the most difficult place to win. The surplus of support compensated for the upstate deficit, uh, deficit. Some activists claim that the victory was a result of war work. Others stress that New York men had surrendered to enfranchisement's inevitability. 1917 was a result of several factors, including, as Eleanor Lerner has shown, support from immigrant and socialists upset about the war. I also want to emphasize the importance of suffragists changing claim to the city, claim they had spent years making which placed them in a strategic position when emergency erupted. They moved from kind of ambivalence about the metropolis to challenging geographies of gender to collaborating with city authorities. Only with a particular focus on urban concerns, urban experiences and urbanization can we understand this trajectory. Now, it would be easy to suggest that New York's victory was a turning point for the federal amendment. And there's certainly some reasons to think that's the case. 45 electoral college votes would now be influenced by women who could also vote for senators and representatives. And it did seem to change some individuals' minds. At least seven members of the House from the Empire State who opposed women's right prior to 1917 agreed to a federal amendment at the 1919 congressional vote. Still, there's not a direct through line from New York State victory to the 19th amendment. In fact, one of the most vocal anti-suffragists in the Senate continued to represent New York State, James Wadsworth. New York senior senator, he's a prominent opponent. He's married to the president of the National Association opposed to women's suffrage. In 1918, he tried to prevent the Senate from voting on the suffrage resolution, working alongside another senator to filibuster it, even after the New York State legislature had sent him a resolution, resolution urging him to support the federal amendment. In 1919, when the resolution did come to a vote, he justified his opposition by depending on states' rights, contending that across the country, citizens had not expressed the desire for a federal amendment. He of course fails to convince enough Senate, senators to oppose his position and went up for reelection again in 1920, he faces opposition from the women who led the suffrage campaign in New York. 
city. And here is um, one of my favorite flyers. In one notable publication, um, I think they pointedly capture the shift that's happened in power and in spheres. They promoted the slogan, Wadsworth's place is in the home. As I outlined today and other scholars have also addressed, women had come out of the home and into the city's streets, parks, restaurants to demand the ballot. And now they're suggesting it's time for their opposition to return home. The vote forever changed women's status within the nation, providing for equal political citizenship, at least on paper. It doesn't, however, eliminate the gender geography of the city, and that's never really suffragist objective. One only needed to ride the subway a few years back and look at the MTA's etiquette campaign to recognize the ways about that assumptions and concerns about gendered bodies continue to anima animate our zeitgeist. Um, to take this example, this is the manspreading posters, um, which are filled with sexual and gendered connotations. They're addressed to a dude with a person. I'm going to the guess the MTA wants us to read that person as a woman uh, looking on and they dot subways, dotted subways. As suffragists keenly understood, gender like class, race, and ethnicity continues to determine access to and comfort within the metropolis shaping and sometimes constraining both ordinary mundane decisions and extraordinary political events. But just as suffragists also understood, we can mobilize the city, its signifying power, its resources, its built environment to contest injustices, demand visibility and assert power. First though, we need to notice, and I thought I would end with this quote from Sarah Ahmed. Um, so much is reproduced by not being noticed. Ahmed writes, by receding into the background. What had receded into the background comes alive when you no longer participate in this, that rece recession. I hope today's um, overview made visible the importance of thinking critically about space and place. And with that, I'd like to invite us to take like a two minute break, um, perhaps to get some water, um, and perhaps you could use it if you wanted to, to loop back to your initial writing that we started with, um, to think about what you notice in your response that perhaps you didn't initially notice or that you would amplify or talk more about. Um, so I will reconvene us at 2.30, let's say 2.38, and then hopefully we have some time for Q&A. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to unmute now. Uh, and um, before we get started, um, I just wanted to comment on something that um, has been important for me for many years. Um, my husband and I lived in Argentina in 1975-76, which was the end of the Peronist government, the beginning of the Dirty War, um, a very difficult time in Argentina. And um, when the military took power, the first faculty that they closed at the University of Buenos Aires was the architecture faculty mm. because they very clearly understood that public spaces were political spaces. And I was shocked that they would have closed the, uh, the architecture faculty because I think in the US we don't think of architecture as something that is political. Um, and But having lived through that time there, um, the political nature of public spaces mm -hmm. and, and of homes um, and became much more obvious to me. And so, uh, Lauren, your lecture today uh, really highlights uh, that uh, issue again. So thank you so much. You. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to kind of talk about, uh, yeah, well, I can field the questions, but uh, uh, I, I'm just thinking about the Wall Street protest a little bit as like a public space that's not really public and how that kind of works. Um, but we can start with the questions if that's... Yes, okay. So um, one of the very first questions was, um, was New York really behind um, 
when it finally approved suffrage in 1917, when it was actually one of the first states east of the Mississippi? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I appreciate that question um, because it's like getting at some of the assumptions that are um, at play here. And I think one of the reasons for me, it feels behind, well, a couple reasons. One is um, that um, a lot of the organizations ultimately come to exist in New York City. Two, that suffragists constantly assume that New York isn't really a place that could be one. Like there's all this kind of assumptions that shape priorities and resources, resource allocation. And three, I think the other thing that's striking, well, three is that the number of leaders who come from New York and four would be that I think we tend to think of Seneca Falls as kind of the birthplace of suffrage. So recognizing that that's 1848, uh, and then we're like talking 1917, that strikes me as a um, pretty long time for us to kind of think through. Um, California, I think is 1911. Um, and there's similar kind of uh, discussions about the urban uh, geography that exists there by other uh, scholars. So I think that's in my mind what uh, does that. And then, I mean, some could, you could kind of potentially make the argument that New York State was a tipping point in terms of the uh, 19th Amendment. I uh, tend to think it's a little bit more complicated than that, as I tried to kind of point out with the Wadsworth example, but um, I appreciate that question. Okay, thank you. Um, there are also a couple of questions having to do with um, uh, have people analyzed the vote, um, the suffrage vote, uh, with regard to class? So mm -hmm. were higher income neighborhoods more likely to vote for suffrage um, versus lower income um, voting districts? You know, that's a great question and like a great mapping question, um, <laughs> because I know we have the city records um, that are broken down by assembly district and who um, what kind of the percentage of individuals that vote. And we also have all that census data. So it would be really kind of cool to do that as a mapping project to align those two things. I'm not, I don't know anyone off the top of my head who's done like a quantitative study like that. Um, there has, uh, Eleanor Lerner wrote a dissertation uh, like uh, in 1980, I think, that talked about ethnicity and breakdowns, uh, but not so much about class and breakdowns. And that strikes me as a, a really good project for um, someone to, like that gets me excited about mapping, right? Because we have all of that information and it would be really cool to kind of click around and see. So I'm not sure that I have a 100% sure answer to that question, but I, I think it's an excellent one that some mapping could maybe help us solve. Okay, uh, good. Um there's a comment here about attire from Karen Curley uh, and that um, the complications of women's dress um, may have been a serious question with regard to um, accessibility to yeah. outdoor spaces. So could you comment on that? Yeah, I was thinking about that quote from the journalist um, who says something along the lines of like, this is them meeting at Cherry's is better than them trailing their skirts through the byways of the city, right? Um, there are a lot of scholars who have focused on fashion and there are suffragists who challenge fashion norms during this time period. I'm thinking of uh, uh, Mary Walker um, and some of the kind of, uh, leaders kind of push back against these challenges of uh, uh, to fashion. But I think, right, like how clothing affects our ability to access space is something really, really important to think through. And we could kind of even see that in that 1911 clip, right? Um, that like how we could see like the women walking through um, very quickly. So um, there are people who can test the, um, fashion norms of the time, um, but they're also not always celebrated by their contemporaries in ways that we might hope them to wish them to be. Okay. Um, Brian Harrison asks, um, how active were the anti people from the anti-suffrage mm -hmm. movement? Um, and uh, that's definitely an issue here. Um, in the Berkshires because um, our um, 
Anna Lawrence Dawes, who was the leading citizen of Pittsfield. Her father had been a, Senate, a representative and then a senator for many years. And she was uh, one of the leaders of the anti-suffrage movement in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. where we also had an unsuccessful vote in 1914, 15. So, right. And there's an 1896, isn't there like an 1896 non-binding vote in Massachusetts or something along those mm -hmm. lines? Um, that is kind of like an anti-suffrage effort is my memory of that. Yes. Yep. Uh, um, so yes, um, <laughs> uh, active. Um, so Susan Gutierrez has written a book on anti-suffragists in New York State specifically. Um, in 1894, they kind of set up their own separate organization. I think, where is it? It's at another, might be at the Waldorf Astoria or something along those lines, like another kind of fancy establishment to um, challenge uh, kind of society suffrage at that point. Uh, and they remain active and are active for um, up, I, I think if memory serves a Gutierrez book, like 1915 is kind of the high point for, and I hope I'm doing Susan justice here, um, the high point for anti-suffrage uh, in New York state, because I think is my memory is that they start to switch towards war work uh, in like 1916, 1917. So aren't quite as active in 1917, um, but sure anti-suffragists are uh, organized. Um, they similarly have a, variety of different reasons that they think that women should not have the vote. There are um, people we know where there's like a husband who opposes the vote and a wife who supports the vote. Um, so that is also complicated. Um, so I think they become really active in 1894. It's kind of the first moment I see kind of an organized thing happening and they remain active for a long time um, in New York State. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Deborah Aaron asks, uh, what did, uh, from learners research that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, what did that tell us about ethnicity and suffrage? Mm, I'm kind of tempted to look at, I have it written down here because I can never, um, it told us that different immigrant groups voted differently, that there wasn't like one, um, one, uh, one answer, like there's not one immigrant group, right? Um, and I'm just looking to see if I have the notes here, which I might not from the top of my head. Um, but I believe she found that Irish immigrants were the most opposed. Um, Italian immigrants, I feel like she said were divided. Russian immigrants tended to support, and then um, uh, native-born Americans also were, um, I think, pretty divided when she compared the different districts. Uh, I could get, I can't find the exact percentages off the top of my head, but I feel like that's, um, that's how that kind of played out. And the important part for me, and I think for Learner, what I learned from Learner is like the complexity is to not just think about immigration, right? To like think about different groups and how they'd be situated vis-a-vis -vis the vote. Um, and I think that's how she, how the, those findings came out. Um, but don't quote me on that. Um, I would um, point uh, some of our class members to um, oh, cool. John Dixon's um, um, uh, materials uh, about suffrage in the Berkshires, which mm. uh, I sent you a link for uh, on the first day of the class, uh, because there was an ethnic difference here in the Berkshires mm -hmm. uh, with the Jewish community mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. being the, com the religious community that supported suffrage most. Um, and, uh, and that, and with the um, Roman Catholic uh, church, um, and then uh, of course associated Irish and Italians mm -hmm. um, uh, were strongly encouraged to vote against uh, here in Massachusetts. Um, yeah. yeah, I was just, I pulled up, uh, this is 1915. Um, uh, Jewish individuals were the most supportive, a challenge generally divided, as did native born, middle and upper class white men. Um, the Irish were kind of most against enfranchisement. Those were the 1915 results um, from Lerner um, about New York City. Mm 
Okay, and uh, Nancy Gilbert asks a question. She says, I have a large poster that says vote yes on the women's suffrage amendment November 2. Mm -hmm. um, and points to the Empire State Suffrage Committee. Um, it, she's asking if this has to do with the 2015 or the 1915. Yeah, yeah it certainly does. And I can um, tell based on two factors. Um, one, the Empire State Campaign Committee is a 1915 or an organization leading up to the 1915. It's kind of like a umbrella organization. Um, and I think uh, 1917 is, uh, November 6th and 1915 is November 2nd. Yeah, that's really, um, I want to see the poster. Uh, <laughs> I'm wondering what's happening on the poster. Like, I'm very curious about the poster. Uh, um, so. Uh, okay, uh, there's another question here. Um, what was Emma, uh, Emma Goldman's role in the suffrage movement in the United States? Um, and in New York in particular. Yeah, I think the leaders I'm talking about um, are distancing from Emma Goldman um, rather than welcoming her in. And I think Goldman has um, maybe uh, not the even larger structural changes in mind. Um, so uh, she's not involved in the suffrage organizations in which I'm looking at. Okay, uh, and there's a question from Larry and Gail, uh, Gail Volk. Uh, would the threat of a women's strike help the passage <laughs> of the ERA now? And I would point out that um, the country of Iceland has had two of these strikes um, and one quite recently. Uh, and in both cases, it was uh, had a dramatic Did um, it? impact. Yes, absolutely. I don't have, I mean, I feel like you will know better than I do. Um, so uh, I don't, I mean, it's interesting to think about, right? Um, uh, I don't, this one doesn't happen. There's a threat of it and the threat actually they think is enough. Uh, and to me, it's really interesting because I think it highlights how visible suffrage had become that all of a sudden all these employees were like, if suffragists hold a strike, everything is going to shut down, right? Like it became a way to really make visible uh, suffrage identity. Uh, I don't know if it would have backfired in 1915 um, because there's other moments or 1914, whatever it was, um, there's other moments where suffragists are taking kind of masculinized spaces and things don't go well. Um, like Wall Street or a boxing ring, ring, even when they're at a baseball stadium, things don't um, go as planned. Uh, so I can't speak to today, um, but it sounds like there's evidence that perhaps it could be helpful. Um, I wonder if in the 19 teens, it might have been used, potentially mobilized or leveraged against them. Okay, uh, good question. Uh, there is another uh, follow-up question um, with regard to learners' uh, mm. research from Stephen Kaiser. Uh, with the ethnic differences on suffrage, mm. are there any theories to explain those differences? I mean, yeah, I mean, I think it, it might partly have to do with how different immigrant groups viewed uh, politics as well as women within politics, right? As one of the, the ways in which um, that's explained, as, uh, including like how women are treated or thought of within families, for instance, would be uh, another thing that came to mind. So I think people have kind of tried to sort through explanations of that. It's interesting because sometimes suffragists are really aware of differences among immigrant groups. Like I talked about Lavinia Dock um, and actually made sure to use a green rather than the yellow of suffrage. Um, but at other times that awareness is completely uh, eliminated. So I went down a rabbit hole a few years ago where I had five or six suffrage flyers that were in different languages. 
was a Yiddish, um, Italian, and maybe Czech, I think. Uh, and so I was able to get, I was fortunate to be able to highlight a few different translators. And I was like, I'm going to really, you know, I'm going to discover something super nuanced here. And it's going to really help me see how thoughtful suffrage organizations were. Um, and I... <laughs> And you could kind of guess the result, which was that they all were photocopied, like were just like translated copies of each other. Um, so it's interesting, like the moments where they're thoughtful versus where it's kind of um, not thoughtful at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let me just want to check here. Um, and that was a disappointing research experience. <laughs> Although a telling one, right? Like yeah. it told me things. It just was not what I wanted to be told. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Gail Gelbert uh, says we've been hearing about um, the activities of suffragists leading up to the 19th Amendment. What was it like after the 19th Amendment was passed? Mm -hmm. And what are, were there things that you can point to that changed for women? uh after 1920. sure i mean and I, I feel like i don't want to uh step on dr robin, robin rosen's toes here a little bit uh, because i know you have a upcoming lecture on this but i certainly think um i tend to think about this in terms of uh, judith sklar who's a political yes. scientist or yeah yes. uh, who talks about voting as a practice and as a status um so for me that sort of conceptualization is really helpful like there's the practical effect of being able to vote and have your voices heard and then there's also like the status of being a voter uh and having kind of that position in society so i think even at a conceptual level, we could think about how important um, 1917 uh, and um, later on are. And of course, there's like, there's, uh, I believe Margaret Chandler Aldrich, who's a suffragist, um, ends up running for office in Dutchess County, or it seems like she runs for office following uh, the vote. Um, so there's these kind of more opportunities and more legislations. Uh, and but then there's a course of like a fracture in the movement in the 1920s again. Um, but I will um, not step on uh, <laughs> Dr. Rosen's toes, who uh, full disclosure was my undergrad advisor. So uh, <laughs> yes. But I would point out to people, even if you want to do some research on it before um, um, Robin's lecture, which will be our last class, is that um, the League of Women Voters, right. so how do you um, mm -hmm. um, educate voters, right. uh, mm -hmm. that started and it was nonpartisan um, mm -hmm. and that came out of the suffrage movement directly. Mm -hmm. uh, also, um, if any of you read the biography of Harriet uh, Stanton Blatch, uh, you know that in those days, if you were an American woman and you married a foreigner, you forfeited your citizenship. Uh, and so that was, there was a bill called the Cable Act, which uh, was passed immediately after uh, suffrage, which changed uh, the rules with regard to citizenship and um, of women uh, who married foreigners and did not mean that it changed the law so that they didn't lose their right. citizenship. Yeah, that's a big deal for Blatch. I think that happened uh, when she loses it. Um, yeah, there's actually an excellent website too that's called like her hat in the ring or something along those lines that mm -hmm. allows you to see women running for political office um, across the country, I think. So I would suggest checking that out too. Okay, so her hat in the ring. Right, I think it's um, throw her hat in the ring or something. I could okay. follow up with you with the exact one, but it's a, it's a DH project that uh, like, I think really gets down to local level too. Okay. Great. Uh, well, I, we promised Lauren that we would um, let her get off at three o'clock so she can pick her children up from school. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, Lauren, I can't thank you enough for, you for a me. really uh, very informative um, and um, mind expanding uh, presentation. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. And thank you for all of the excellent questions. Okay. Thank okay. you. All right. Take care.
Bye-bye.